Hi, in this video we are going to discuss some tools for you to design your algorithm. Before we're talking about the tools, let's watch a video to see what is an algorithm. What's an algorithm? In computer science, an algorithm is a set of instructions for solving some problem, step by step. Typically, algorithms are executed by computers, but we humans have algorithms as well. For instance, how would you go about counting the number of people in a room? Well, if you're like me, you'd probably point at each person, one at a time, and count up from zero. One, two, three, four, and so forth. Well, that's an algorithm. In fact, let's try to express it a bit more formally in pseudocode, English-like syntax that resembles a programming language. Let n equal zero. For each person in room, set n equal to n plus one. How to interpret this pseudocode? Well, line one declares, so to speak, a variable called n and initializes its value to zero. This just means that at the beginning of our algorithm, the thing with which we're counting has a value of zero. After all, before we start counting, we haven't counted anything yet. Calling this variable n is just a convention. I could have called it most anything. Now, line two demarks the start of a loop, a sequence of steps that will repeat some number of times. So in our example, the step we're taking is counting people in the room. Beneath line two is line three, which describes exactly how we'll go about counting. The indentation implies that it's line three that will repeat. So what the pseudocode is saying is that after starting at zero, for each person in the room, we'll increase n by one. Now, is this algorithm correct? Well, let's bang on it a bit. Does it work if there are two people in the room? Let's see. In line one, we initialize n to zero. For each of these two people, we then increment n by one. So on the first trip through the loop, we update n from zero to one. On the second trip through that same loop, we update n from one to two. And so by this algorithm's end, n is two, which indeed matches the number of people in the room. So far, so good. How about a corner case though? Suppose that there are zero people in the room, besides me, who's doing the counting. In line one, we again initialize n to zero. This time though, line three doesn't execute at all since there isn't a person in the room, and so n remains zero, which indeed matches the number of people in the room. Pretty simple, right? But counting people one at a time is pretty inefficient too, no? Surely we can do better. Why not count two people at a time? Instead of counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so forth, why not count two, four, six, eight, and so on? It even sounds faster and it surely is. Let's express this optimization in pseudocode. Let n equal zero. For each pair of people in room, set n equal to n plus two. Pretty simple change, right? Rather than count people one at a time, we instead count them two at a time. This algorithm does twice as fast as the last. But is it correct? Let's see. Does it work if there are two people in the room? In line one, we initialize n to zero. For that one pair of people, we then increment n by two. And so by this algorithm's end, n is two, which indeed matches the number of people in the room. Suppose next that there are zero people in the room. In line one, we initialize n to zero. As before, line three doesn't execute at all since there aren't any pairs of people in the room. And so n remains zero, which indeed matches the number of people in the room. But what if there are three people in the room? How does this algorithm fare? Let's see. In line one, we initialize n to zero. For a pair of those people, we then increment n by two, but then what? There isn't another full pair of people in the room, so line two no longer applies. And so by this algorithm's end, n is still two, which isn't correct. Indeed, this algorithm said to be buggy because it has a mistake. Let's redress with some new pseudocode. Let n equal zero. For each pair of people in room, set n equal to n plus two. If one person remains unpaired, set n equal to n plus one. To solve this particular problem, we've introduced in line four a condition, otherwise known as a branch, that only executes if there's one person we could not pair with another. And so now, whether there's one or three or any odd number of people in the room, this algorithm will now count them. Can we do even better? Well, we could count in threes or fours or even fives and tens, but beyond that, it's going to get a little bit difficult to point. At the end of the day, whether executed by computers or humans, algorithms are just a set of instructions with which to solve problems. These were just three. What problem would you solve with an algorithm?
So after you design your solution and you figure out the general solution of your modules, now is the time for you to design your program. And we basically have three type of ways to design your program. First is the flowchart, which is still a design tool. So we can use the flowchart to draw your algorithm and then you don't really need to implement your algorithm. Uh, someone else can read the flowchart to understand your algorithm. The second approach is more like source code. We call it a pseudocode. It's not programming language, but it looks like a programming language. And this approach is widely used in the research papers. Because of the page limits, we cannot put the entire source code into the research paper. So in this case, we just show them the pseudocode. The third one, of course, is the programming language. You can use your programming language to implement your algorithm. So in this part, let's look at the flowchart. A flowchart is a graphical representation of the sequence of operations in an algorithm. So the flowchart will show you the flow and also the logic of your program. Let's see some symbols first. The first one is the processing. It's a rectangle, so we use a rectangle in the flowchart to represent some processing. The line with an arrow is called a flow line, so this represents the flow of your algorithm. The diamond symbol means the decision symbol, meaning that you have to make a decision at this point. And the decision symbol can have two outputs, true or false. The first symbol in this page is the terminal or terminator shape. So this shape tells you where the flowchart begins and ends. It shows you the entry point of the flowchart. You could fill this shape with the words like start or begin to designate the start of the flowchart. Usually a flowchart has one starting point. However, a flowchart can have as many ending points as needed. The parallelogram is used as the input and output. If you want to print out something or get some input, you can use this symbol. A small circle is used as the connector. So if a flowchart is very large, you can use the connector to connect different parts of the flowchart. There are only three basic control structures, sequence, selection, and the repetition. We could use the symbols to represent the three types of control structures. The sequence control structure shows one or more actions following each other in order. So this is the simplest structure. You just put the action one after another. Like shown in this figure, has three actions. They will be executed sequentially. Let's look at this example. For given values, we need to calculate the area and circumference of a circle. The algorithm for this problem is quite simple. We can just use the formulas listed here to calculate the area and circumference. So this will be the flowchart for this algorithm. We have one start point and one end point, which are the two terminators. For the first step, we use the parallelogram to get the input from the user. After we get the radius, we can calculate the area by using this formula. So next step, we calculate the area and we put the result in the S, which is a variable. Next, we calculate the circumference. We use 2 times pi times r, so which will be the circumference of this circle. Next step is the output. We use the parallelogram to print out the s and l. And next is the end. So this is a typical sequential program. So we have several steps, and we just follow the flow of the program and it will execute every of the steps. This is another sequential algorithm that survives the value of two variables, a and b. So first you have a equals to 1 and b equals to 2. And then you assign a to c, assign b to a, and then assign c to b. And then you can print out a and b. This is the algorithm of swapping the value of a and b. If we want to test this algorithm, we can simulate the execution of this algorithm. So initially, a equals to 1 and b equals to 2. The first step, we will assign a to c. So c will equal to 1. 
and then we assign b to a so a equals to 2 and then we assign c to b so b equals to 1 so right now a equals to 2 and b equals to 1 which will be the result of this program the second control structure is called the selection or condition sometimes we have two types of selection control structure the left side figure is the condition so it has one input and one condition and then it have two output branches true or false so in both of the branch you can execute some actions so we call it if then else so it means that uh, if the condition here is true it goes to this branch else it goes to this branch the second type of the selection control structure is called the case so you have one input but you can have multiple output branches you have a condition expression here but you can generate multiple conditions so in this case you have four conditions and each of the conditions will correspond to one branch the condition expression often use equality operators or relational operators for example we have equals to not equal to less than greater than etc the result of all of these operators are logical values true and false the equality operator equal equal is different from the assignment operator with only one equal um, this one is a comparison of two operand if they are same the result will be true if they are not same the result will be false but the second one is assignment meaning you are going to change the other value with the you know the, with the first value this example shows you how to use the selection condition structure you have two input numbers and you want to print out the greater value so we start from the start point and then the first step is to get the two values so this is an input and output operation the next step is the condition structure so you're going to compare the two values if r is greater than or equals to h if the result is yes it goes to this branch so r will be the greater value if the result is no then h will be the greater value and then we can print out the greater value which is max this example is a little bit complicated compared with the previous one so you need to classify the score of a student so if the score is greater than or equals to 90 then it is a if it's less than 90 but greater than 80 then it's b if the score is less than 80 but greater or equals to 60 it's c if the score is less than 60 it's d so it's pretty easy to understand but how to design the algorithm just like the previous algorithm we got the input first and then we can compare the input with the you know different numbers so first we got the score and then we are going to compare the score with 90 if the number is greater than or equals to 90 yes and then we print out a otherwise we go to this branch and then we are going to compare the score with 80 if the score is greater or equals to 80 it goes to this branch then it is b because if we go to this branch that means the score is not greater than 90 it must be less than 90 so if we go to this branch that means n is greater than or equals to 80 but less than 90 similarly we go to this branch that means the score is less than 80 if the score is greater than 60 we print c otherwise we print d and then we go to the end of the algorithm so this is how you use the flowchart to design the algorithm so suppose you got a flowchart like this i think it will be very easy for you to make the program the third control structure is called the repetition 
or we can call it loop. And we basically have two types of loops. The loop structure looks pretty similar as the conditional structure because we do have one conditional control structure inside of the loop. So here we have one condition and it also has two output branches, true or false. But the difference is that uh, if the condition is true, it goes to this branch and it will execute the action here. And after the execution of the action, it will go back to the beginning of the condition structure as the flow line shows here. So here is a loop. Every time you go back to the beginning of the condition structure, you need to test the condition again to see whether the condition is still true or false. In this case, if the condition is true, it goes to here. If the condition is false, it goes to here. And if the condition is false, it goes to this direction, which will be out of the loop. This is called the do while well control structure. The second type of the loop is called do until control structure. In this control structure, we execute the action first, and then you test the condition. If the condition is false in this case, it will go back to the beginning of the action. If the condition is true, it will go out of the loop. We can definitely change the value of these two conditions. So for here, we can use false. And here, we can use true. It's the same. So what's the difference between these two type of loops? The difference is that for the do until control structure, this action will be executed for at least one time. Because according to the control flow, you will go directly to the action. And after you execute the action, you're going to you know, test the condition. Even the condition is not matched, this action will be executed for one time. But for the do while control structure, this action may not be executed at all because the condition may be not matched. If in this case the result is false, it will not execute this action at all. Let's take a look at this example. For given k, we need to calculate the sum of from 1 to k because we don't know what exactly is k. So we cannot use the sequential control structure to read this algorithm. And the formula for this problem will like s will equals to s plus i. And i is changing from 1 to k. So suppose k equals to 5, and i initially equals to 0. So when i equals to 1, s will be 0 plus 1, which is 1. And then you're going to increase i by 1 and then i will be 2. So when i equals to 2, s will be you know, 1 plus 2, which is 3, because this one is you know, the previous value of s. And then we're going to increase i by 1 again, and then i will be 3. So when i equals to 3, s will be s plus i, which is 3 and then result will be 6, and then we increase i by 1, and then i will equals to 4. When i equals to 4, s will be 6 plus 4, which is 10, and then i will be changed to 5. When i equals to 5, s will equals to 15, and then we increase i by 1, which will be 6. So if we write an algorithm to calculate this S here, uh, it will look like this flowchart. First, we get K. And then we set up the initial value of I and S, which is 1 and 0. And then we're going to have a loop. So we compare I with K. 
k here is suppose this 5. So if i is less than 5, if you calculate this one and this one, and then if you go back to the beginning of the condition to test the i with k again, because we have increased the i by 1, so here we have i equals to actually 2. But 2 is still less than 5. It will add s with i again. After several iterations, i will equal to 5, and 5 is equal to 5, because k is still 5. And then we can calculate s by using 10 plus 5 equals to 15, so this will be the value of s. And then we're going to increase i by 1 again, so i will be 6. So the next time you go back to the beginning of the condition, and because i is 6, you're going to compare 6 with 5, so the condition is not true anymore. So it become false. So here we're going to this part, which will be the output part. So this shows you how the loop works. And the i here we used is called the loop index. And the loop index is used to control the number of iterations, you know, execute in the loop. In this example, there are 50 students and you are requested to print the scores which are more than 80. We use i as the loop index, and we use gi to represent the score of the i's student. So if gi is greater or equals to 80, we just print out the number of the student and also the score of the student. Otherwise, we increase the i by 1. And then we are going to compare i with 50. If i is greater than 50, we go to the end of the program. If i is less than 50, we go to the beginning of this part. In this flowchart, we have two conditional operators, this one and this one. And the first one is a conditional structure, and the second one is actually a loop. Here's another example. You are requested to display a square with the length of m. So the input is m and you're going to print out m lines. And for each line, you have m elements. The element here is the asterisk. For example, if you input m equals to 4, the output should be like this one. You have four lines. For each line, you have four asterisks. So the algorithm will be like this. So this is the algorithm. It starts from here, the starting point, because the flowchart is kind of like big. So we use two connectors, A and B, to connect two parts. So let's go through this algorithm. You get M first, and then you use I, which is the loop index. So we use I to compare with M. If I is less than or equals to M, we do in this part. And then we increase I by 1. And then go back here to compare i with m again. If i is greater than m, we go to the end of the program. So we use i to control how many lines of the figure we're going to print out. And the program here is used to print out one line. So for the inner part of this program, we start from this connector. And we use another loop index j. And we set j initially equals to 1. So we use j to compare with m again, because for each of the line, we also have m stars. So if j is less than or equals to m, we print out one asterisk. And then we increase j by 1. And then we go to the beginning of this condition to compare j with m again. If j is still less than m, we continuously print in the asterisks. If j is greater than m, we go to the new line part because we finished printing one line. So we need to print out a new line to change to the next line. And then we go back to this part. 
So in this program, the outer part used to print M lines, and the inner part is used to print out one line. So let's try to run this program. Initially, M equals to 4, and uh, I equals to 1. So because I is less than 4, so we go into the inner part of the program. And uh, we set j equals to 1. Because 1 is less than 4, so we print out 1 star on the screen. And then we increase j by 1. So j will be equal to 2. And 2 is still less than 4. So we print out another star. So on the screen, we're going to have 2 stars. And then we increase j by 1. Again, we print out one star. So on the screen, we have three stars. And then we increase j by one. So j will be equals to four. Because four is equals to four, so we're going to print out another star. So on the screen, we're going to have four stars. And then we're going to increase j by one. So j will be equals to five. So this time, five is not less than four. So we're going to out of the loop. So next, we're going to print out a new line. So it means that we're going to change to the new line. And then we're going to increase i by 1. So i will be equal to 2. So again, 2 is still less than 4. So going to the inner part again. So j will be set to 1 again. We're going to continue the previous steps. So j equals to 1, 2, 3, and 4. So we're going to print out 4 stars and then to the new line. And then we increase i by 1 to print out the third line and then the fourth line. So this is how the algorithm executes. We can definitely draw the flowchart on a piece of paper, but actually there are plenty of softwares that support drawing the flowchart. You can use the Microsoft Visual to draw the flowchart, or you can also use some online tools to draw the flowchart. These are the contents for this video.